Since the fall of man, a war has raged between good and evil. Over the centuries, this war has distorted the truth. Now the truth is perceived as lies, and lies acknowledged as truth. To this day, the battle continues as we investigate and debate the truth behind the history and mystery of the universe. We are Paratruth Radio. The Wraith may look similar to other grim ghosts. However, it is a rather unknown spiritual being of folklore. Yet it has been used in media quite often and has made appearances in books, movies, and video games. But it wasn't until 2004 that the Wraith found real fame when it was introduced as a frightening dark spirit being in the movie known as Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Now Paratruth presents Wraith. The origin of Harry Potter's Dementors. Hey, Parafans. Welcome to Paratruth Radio. I'm Justin. And I'm Eric. And tonight we are going to be talking about the Wraith. The Wraith. Now, for those of you that don't know what the Wraith is, really all it boils down to is the Wraith is a Scottish word meaning ghost or spirit. That's the most simplest definition that it comes down to. But uh, Eric came across some folklore as well, so we're going to give you some folklore, we're going to give you the the main definition of what the Wraith is, and a little bit of personal experiences as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, the, basically the main definition is what Justin just told you. It's a Scott, Wraith is a Scottish word for ghost, apparition, or spirit, and that's pretty much what this creature is. But it also refers to a rather unpleasant or grotesque version of a human ghost. Uh, now, normally you think ghost or spirit. I think most people think human, you know, human ghost, human spirits. And of course, you know my opinion. I think it's demons regardless. But in this case, Wraith is a human ghost that happens to be an unpleasant being uh, or grotesque in nature. But why? The reason or the question is why? And the reason is... According to some folklore, now the myth kind of jumps all around and has a couple of different views as to what the wraith is. But one that I came across that's pretty common is that the wraith is associated with an undead sorcerer or sorceress who failed to become healthy at their deathbed. Now, what that means is basically what they would well basically what they would do is these sorcerers or sorceresses when they were starting to i guess decline in health they would come up with this concoction of of uh potions and magic spells that they would then use to try to either heal themselves or bring them back to life after dying now, of course, none of this would ever happen, uh, of course, because magic isn't real. <laughs> and I know some people out there may argue with me. Right. But what would happen is that these, these potions would take a weird effect on the dead body of these sorcerers or sorceresses, and it would cause these people or their spirit to come back to life in a sense, but as a wraith. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, you think of a, you know, someone dying and suddenly their human spirit is haunting a building. You know, that's what I think most people jump to. It's the same thing here, except that these potions are twisting the spirit into becoming something that's grotesque and angry and pretty much sets it out to want to like vengeance for vengeance sets it out for vengeance it goes around it tries to kill anything or anybody it comes in contact with and surprisingly enough according to this particular folklore the only way that this spirit can survive is by feeding off of the life source of other human beings now with that said there are two other views the second view 
is that these wraiths take on a doppelganger form. They actually look like somebody else in the world. And if that person, the living person, sees this spirit that looks just like them, that is a sign of impending doom, and that person will die in two weeks or less. Also, if this spirit who looks like someone else appears to this other person's family or friends, that again is also impending doom, and this person will die eventually at some point soon. Now again, this is just myth, legend. There's no solid facts, no solid evidence to support these claims whatsoever, and I personally don't believe in it at all. But, you know, as Paratruth Radio, we like to give you all the information that we can. Absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. So, and one thing that uh, most people don't know is Abraham Lincoln actually had a doppelganger come to him before he was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth and it he was looking in a mirror and it looked like half of his face was gray and lifeless and it was only there for a brief moment and then it was gone but to him he took that as as you said a warning of death Mm mm-hmm which is very interesting, you know? I mean, it's like, do people really have the ability to see that? Or is that a demonic spirit that is, you know, manipulating your mind to cause you to see something that they know is going to happen? I don't know. I don't have an exact answer for that. Yeah, and <clears throat> we'll, we'll get a little bit more into in depth into what else the Wraith may remind us of. Uh, but uh, one of those things which we will start to uh, to unravel a little bit after the first break here is the angel of death mm-hmm. and that could it kind of explain it too not that the angel of death would necessarily reveal himself but maybe some people get a glimpse i don't know if you can consider it a warning because usually they end up dying anyways right <laughs> it's not like they can change their fate. Right. But, like, what's the point? Right. It's just like a waste of time. Uh, there is, of course, a third myth behind this creature, this being, whatever it is. And it's the belief that a wraith appears as an old woman. And like the rest of these wraiths, is often dressed in either a black or dark purple robe and carries a large Sith. And that this this woman, this old woman, or this wraith, would hover over the water. Any water. It could be the ocean. It could be a lake. And it would call people to her. And basically, it would lead them right into their death by drowning. Which, you know... It is very interesting because it also reminds me of a flip-flop of things when we talk about the siren. Uh, I think that's something we may have covered a little bit during Paratruth Radio. I don't. I, honestly, I start mixing up all of our different shows that we've had in the past with these. Night Stalkers, Forgotten Truth, Paratruth, uh, Parasite. Well, I mean, I mean a lot crazy. of these creatures kind of intermingle, too. So That's true, yeah. Well... According to folklore, the siren is a half woman, half bird that sits on the edge of the coast. It could be and it could be on, you know, just on the sand. It could be up in the uh, cliffs, you name it. And they sing out to sailors on the sea. They have this beautiful song that they sing and it attracts the sailor and even tends to put them in this almost in this weird trance. And it causes them to sail right up to the shore, get dashed to pieces by rocks, sink the boat, and everybody dies. So, you know, it's really interesting to me. And, of course, not which is these two particular myths, but when we look at the majority of folklore out there, the majority of myth, whether it be Greek myth or pagan myth or, you know, you name it there always seems to be some kind of death at the end of it. You know, a lot of it seems pretty dark. And of course there are some light things here and there, but for the most part, it's all dark. And I start to wonder, 
is it because this is all based off of some sort of truth and that this evil really has happened? Or is it that people are so intrigued by death and by darkness and by evil that they just make up these stories and they share it because people like to be scared. They end people like to scare people. Well, one thing I wonder if the sirens song kind of sounds like this. You see that that now that's interesting because probably a good several hundred years ago people might be interested in like what that is. <laughs> Me, if I hear that song, I know I'm probably going to get like a sledgehammer to the head <laughs> or a piano is about to fall on me or, you know, a giant black hole is going to open in the floor and I'm going to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you were saying how people's mind kind of went to dark things, as you had said in previous episode, when we were talking to, uh, talk supernatural, Heidi and mm-hmm. uh, Scott, that mm-hmm. most people don't want to think that a demon is, is on their trail. So they think of something still just as sinister or a little bit less sinister and give it a different name. Uh, also, there are different folklores where Christianity wasn't around yet, and they had to come up with something to, to describe what this thing was. Right. Well, and just to go on a little bit more real quick about this wraith before our first break, it's probably... Just, just kind of give you an idea of where, it, according to folklore, it likes to hang out and what it likes to do. Yeah, I already told you that it tends to feed off of people uh, spiritually. It tends to feed off their spirit, take their life. And if it doesn't feed, it just happens to vanish. It disappears. It's destroyed. They are very dark entities. They're dark. They're They're evil. It's because they're corrupted. They're corrupted by the evil at which the human had used before dying. Of course, evil makes evil. And so when these wraiths, you know, are are moving around about the earth, they tend to make their home in dark, sinister places. And it's said that they're even powerful enough or can become powerful enough to possess humans. Which I think is very interesting, too, because I don't think ever in... Uh, yeah, I don't think ever in anything that I've read or anything that I've uh, uh, encountered personally or any of the shows that I've watched that a human being has ever been able to possess another human being, like a human spirit being capable of possessing a human being, if indeed human spirits exist. It's always been demonic. Only demons can possess things. They have that power. Now, I personally believe it's because only demons exist on earth. They they walk this earth, and humans either go to heaven or to hell. I know, Justin, you would say otherwise, but what do you think in regards to this idea? Like, Is it possible in your knowledge or what you believe that human spirits can possess other humans? I've thought about that a lot, and I, I don't believe that human spirits can possess. If, if what is going on is human spirits... But there, I mean, there have been people who use what they call channeling, and supposedly mm-hmm. the human spirit goes into them. Which I, I don't believe that part at all. I don't believe that you can have another spirit with you other than a, a demon possessing you. No, a human. I don't believe a human spirit can possess. Right. So no, uh, and that I mean that's that even straddles on the the mainstream view too some people believe you can use channeling to to get human spirits and they they come into your body so that they can speak through your mouth and some people believe no so that's true okay so all right folks we are going to take our first break uh we've got a couple of personal experiences a little more info for you guys but uh we will be right back right after Eric's random fact of the day. Now, Eric's random fact of the day. Today, the purchase price for a single ticket to Disneyland starts at $93. However, did you know that the very first Disneyland admissions ticket ever sold cost just as much as a McDonald's McDouble is priced today? 
It's true. According to Nidorama.com, Roy O. Disney, Walt Disney's older brother, actually purchased the very first Disneyland admissions ticket back in 1955 for one single dollar. <laughs> All right, folks, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name's Justin. And I'm Eric. And we've been talking about the Wraith. We've we've given you guys the, the basic definition of what the Wraith is. As we said, it's the Scottish word for ghost or spirit. Uh, Eric came across actually some folklore about it. Uh, he's also got another source of information for you guys. Yes, I do. This, well, this is interesting. To say the least. Now, we've already, as Justin just mentioned, have given you pretty descriptive stuff. Now, there's not much on the wraith in general. Uh, in fact, the word wraith or the knowledge, the yeah, the knowledge of the wraith, I guess, uh, goes back to 1513, which is a long time ago, like several years. Like, I don't even remember that year. It's been so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you believe in reincarnation, I don't think you were around back then. But 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 God God says like I live forever because you know if we're saved, we never truly meet death. But does that mean before you come to life? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> But what if uh, this is going to take us into something completely different? <laughs> because I, I do have, okay, real quick. We're not going to go too long into this. Just going to just be real quick. I'm going to throw this out there. The Bible says that God knew us from the beginning, that he knew us before we were born. And it's pretty simple. It says that he knew us, that, you know, since the beginning, since, since he created the foundations of the earth, he knew us. And I question is it possible that all of us existed in heaven at one point and then God sent us to earth and said, it's your turn, daughter. It's your turn, son. It's your turn, child. Go and enjoy life on earth. Because the scripture does say that this is not our real home and that we will be brought back home. For those who are saved and who know Christ will be back, brought home to heaven and I think that word home, like, how can it be home if I was never there in the first place? And thus, we were there at one point. We've all existed in heaven at one point, and God just, you know, sends our spirits down to earth. Now, of course, that's way out there. There's no biblical truth to that whatsoever. There's there's no evidence for that. There's nothing that supports it at all. It's just a question I come up with and just something fun that I'm like, huh. But Because uh, there are people that... Well, I mean, there's three things. There are people that believe in reincarnation. There are people that believe that we're just our souls just created right away, and then once we're dead, we're back, or we go we go home, quote unquote. Um, and then, like you're saying, there are people that believe that we are always, and we go down to earth. God sends us down to earth to have that experience and then come back. So yeah. there's there's three different ways, just like the wraith. Right. Yeah. What do you know? Now, of course, if, if that did happen, folks, if if it was true that we all existed in heaven at one point, and by no means do I even necessarily fully believe that by any means, the reason that when we come to earth, we then, you know, we don't all come back to heaven. Some of us go to hell if we don't believe in Christ. And the reason that that is is because God doesn't want puppets loving him. If that makes any sense to anybody, if not, it's just like... If Justin, I'm going to use you as an example, buddy. Oh, no. Yes. Let's go with our wonderful co-producer, Shelly. <laughs> She's going to be like, oh, no, my name's in the show again. Um, let's say you, obviously, you're mar- going to marry her, so you love her. Yeah. So let's say you love her, but she doesn't love you back. Do you go out of your way to find some kind of, I don't know, 
sorcerer of some sort who can put a spell on her and make her fall in love with you? Or would you rather her love you free willingly? Well, I because, wouldn't seek out a sorcerer, so no. Right. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Well, beside that, you know, the the point is, if you go and seek out some way to make somebody love you, you know that her, their love isn't real. It was placed there by somebody else or by something else. Right. It was created. God doesn't want that either. God originally originally created Adam and Eve to love him and to you know do God's will by taking control of the earth and you know populating the earth and so on and so forth but then God is like well I want them to choose to love me you know right. that's what real love is the choice and so yeah he allowed sin to enter he gave them the choice of eating from the uh, tree of good and evil um, and he of course commanded them not to eat from it but that's where free will comes in, and they did. And now, for those people who choose God, it's true love. They truly choose God because they love him. And those people will end up in heaven. And the ones that don't choose God, who don't choose Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, they'll perish in hell. And I know that's very harsh, the way I just put that, but it's true. And sometimes it just has to be that way. Anyway, off the rabbit trail, we'll go back. <laughs> So, yeah, there's this description I came across, um, another little weird, funny thing I actually found funny. I was laughing a bit. Uh, I'm not going to name where I got this. I'm not going to even name the uh, author who posted this blog, but it is a blog and it's about the wraith. And for the most part, she got a couple of things right. You know, the wraith is associated with the Grim Reaper in a sense that they look alike uh, and that it was created by this form of magic that sorcerers or sorceresses would use on themselves. However, it goes a little beyond that. And she wrote, This myth is not common or easy to find reliable information. I agree. It's a pain trying to find any information on the, on the uh, wraith. However, it is said that it feeds from the brain of its victim. Now, Justin, what do you know? What cryptid or what creature do you know feeds on the brain of its victim brains mm -hmm. zombies i just mentioned that according to folklore these spirits feed from the life source and in other words the spirit of another human but brains doesn't really make sense to me on top of this <laughs> apparently since this being is unholy if in the presence of a holy person, it will be destroyed. Now, that's, of course, impossible because spirits cannot be destroyed by humans. Uh, only God can destroy a spirit. And we know that he doesn't ever, that I know of, literally destroy a spirit in which it doesn't exist anymore. It usually exists either on earth, in heaven, or in hell. Period. Um, and the final thing. This one, this one's kind of good. Wooden stakes, people, are also said to be a wraith's weakness. Justin, what are wooden stakes usually used to kill? Yep. Yeah. Vampires, folks. Mm -hmm. Vampires. First and foremost... It's common knowledge that a wooden stake would kill a vampire, according to folklore. What's interesting, though, here is that a wooden stake is a literal physical object that we as humans can hold, where a wraith is a spirit. It has no physical solid form. So how exactly does a piece of wood kill something you cannot touch? Literally, because you just go straight through it. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Is it allergic to wood? I don't know. <laughs> but it's just crazy. It's crazy. It's like this whole giant mesh of a number of different creatures and folklore thrown into this wraith myth. Yeah. So I, I don't know. It's An weird. amalgam, if you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's pretty much the full description of what we have on the wraith. And of course, a few little interesting weird stuff but as we said before going to break oh so short yet long ago <laughs> <laughs> 
we do have some personal experiences to talk about. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children should not be listening right now because it's scary stuff. <laughs> We will be right back after we hear Justin's Paranormal Headlines. And now, Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Hey, Parafans. Justin here with your Paranormal Headlines. These headlines are from unexplainedmysteries.com. A black hole could turn you into a hologram. Scientists have come up with a novel new way to account for what happens inside a black hole. With a gravitational pull so great that not even light can escape, black holes remain inherently mysterious and scientists have long struggled to make sense of what goes on inside them. Quantum physics dictates that the information of an object that falls into a black hole cannot be destroyed or lost, so where does it go? What does it become? One recently proposed answer to this conundrum lies in measuring the information that is sucked into a black hole, not in the conventional three dimensions we are used to, but in two dimensions, thus effectively turning the object into a hologram. Would this mean that a person could survive such a trip? Probably not. But then what would an existence in two dimensions even be like? Surviving such a transition seems unfathomable. Real life holodeck is now one step closer. Scientists in Japan have developed a new type of hologram that can be both observed and touched. Holograms have been a staple of science fiction for some years now, in particular in the Star Trek franchise where the holodeck is often portrayed as the ultimate in simulated reality experiences. While creating entire worlds to walk around in is still quite a few years away yet, Researchers in Japan recently demonstrated that creating a physical hologram is something that is genuinely achievable. The impressive invention uses femtosecond lasers to produce the image of a small fairy in mid-air that human observers can actually touch with their fingers. It works by agitating particles in the air so that when someone touches it, they can feel the image as though it had a solid presence. The technology could prove particularly useful in the creation of holographic interfaces such as computer keyboard made of light that can be projected onto a surface. In the future, it may also be possible to use holograms to communicate with another person during a video chat or to provide tactile feedback when playing an online game. And this has been Justin with your Paranormal Headlines. This was a segment of Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Eric. I'm Justin. And just before the break, we were talking about our topic, which is wraiths. Um, in particular, some funny, goofy stuff. Wait, wraiths or wraiths? Wraith. Wraith. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, that's a different topic altogether, and that's a different type of demon. Um, you're thinking of the incubus slash succubus. Oh, oh, got it. Sorry. This is a wraith. It's kind of like a uh, Grim Reaper type of thing, minus the whole Grim Reaper part. <laughs> um, <laughs> and by the way, for anyone... Last particular- week you lie, but you don't lie. And this week, <laughs> a wraith yeah. is a grim reaper, but not really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as we had mentioned a little earlier earlier in the show, we do have some personal experiences that we would like to talk about. And so I think we're going to kick that off right about now. So, Justin, go. 
All right, so we were doing uh, Night Stalkers Radio. We had Night Stalkers Paranormal Society, and we were doing investigations. And uh, one investigation that we did was just a personal one. It wasn't for a client. We went to a lake that's in Cleveland Metro Parks. Forgive me, I don't remember the lake name. But uh, we went there because supposedly a creature known as the Wraith was at this place haunting this place uh the the belief was was this was a creature that was summoned by native americans because it was a place of a a native american massacre to seek vengeance on the white man for for destroying this this tribe that was there and uh, we were doing an investigation uh we were using different types of equipment and I don't believe there was really a whole lot of evidence that we got as far as EVP or EMF. But uh, one thing that happened to me personally was that uh, we uh, were were walking around and uh, at one point I was kind of off by myself. And all of a sudden I felt this tightness in my chest, almost like somebody was grabbing my chest or like squeezing my chest or grabbing into me and grabbing my heart. Uh, I had a little bit of shortness of breath. Uh, Some people could attribute that to an anxiety attack, which I'm not denying that, but I had nothing to be anxious about. Yes, we were on an investigation, but I, I never had gotten anxious before and not since. Uh, so it was it was very disconcerting. Uh, a lot of times when a lot of ghost hunters and Eric can attribute this as well. When you feel a spirit that's maybe not so good, if if you believe in human spirits, anyways, uh, you, you get this heaviness. Uh, you almost feel like you can't breathe. That's kind of what was going on for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I believe Eric had uh, a few. Uh, things to say about that investigation as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you know, and I, I've actually thought about this particular investigation just last week, oddly enough. And I think it's mostly due to the fact that I was driving down along the canal <clears throat> on canal road, which is where this lake is located. Well, kind of just off right of that area. But, uh, as Justin had mentioned, I don't recall getting any real EV, uh, EMF readings, and I don't recall any literal like EVPs. But we did use this device. It's known as a ghost box, or some people may uh, know it as a Radio Shack hack. And basically what this device does is it cycles through radio stations rapidly, causing a type of white noise and it allows certain words to infiltrate this white noise. And the idea is that the spirit is capable of either creating its own words or using specific words that it chooses from the radio stations to make up sentences so that it can talk to you on a real basis, you know, in real time, a one-on-one. And now, like many ghost hunters out there, I guess, uh, investigators, we kind of, Justin and I, we always discredit anything that we hear from the ghost box because you can never be a hundred percent sure that it's actually a spirit talking or if it's just a radio channel kicking in at a random coincidence type of time. If you believe in coincidence (laughs) in any sort, right. Um, which I do and I don't, so I don't, I don't know. (laughs) And uh, I think, I don't know if any, any, Buddy credits it, but uh, unlike an EVP on a digital recorder where you can hear an answer or hear a voice other than the people around you, mainly because when you're doing an investigation and you either hear people talking or hear a noise, you record that. You, you say so and so talking, or there was mm-hmm. somebody knocked something over there. So. Right. The the ghost box isn't necessarily the most the most reliable, as Eric said. Right. And so as we were walking, I, I recall vividly that we were walking as a group with our team from NSPS. And I never once put the headphones on to listen to it. I don't recall exactly who all listened to it. But the one guy that was listening to it, and I can't say that what he was telling me was 100% true. 
because I couldn't hear it. And of course, we ended up having some issues with this particular member of our team and eventually had to kick him off the team. But he, as we were walking, he said, quoting exactly what this box was saying, it said three words, Eric, blood, death. Very interesting, especially when you think of this wraith. You know, there's, there's supposed to be a wraith here, and according to the folklore, a wraith is a rather violent spiritual being. It, it just kind of kind of tied things in. It, it made sense. Again, could it have been complete coincidence? Could this particular person be hearing something that, you know, like misinterpreting words, if you will? Uh, could it have been a complete lie? Could this guy have been telling us lies? It's possible, especially based on some other evidence that we eventually came to the reason of to us deciding to kick him off the team. Yeah. I don't know, but it was interesting. It was, it was kind of creepy. You know, I was a little weirded out by it, but yeah, that was one. The second thing is that we were walking through a wooded area. There are no lights whatsoever. It's pitch black. I think it was probably like what? Nine, 10 o'clock in the, around Somewhere fall time. Around yeah. Right. I think it's fall. So, you know, sun sets a little earlier. So it's pitch black. We're walking through this area trying to do an investigation accidentally scaring some girls as we're going um i did i remember them walking out of the woods and freaking out (laughs) when they saw us like what the heck but um anyway we were taking pictures as any paranormal investigator would do and this person had like a distorted a camera that was kind of distorted He, he did it purposely apparently to try and catch an apparition easier What it really did was just take like a light source and create a stream off of it, which made it look like there's a ghost passing through. Or he had a really nasty, stupid camera that didn't work right. Right. One of the two. Either way, that was one of the reasons we got rid of him. Yeah. Anyway, we're walking through and he's taking picture after picture after picture. We, you know, nothing going on. Finally, he takes one picture. He's using the flash on the camera. And I can't remember if it was an infrared camera or not. I don't think it was i think it was just a digital camera yeah it was just a regular digital camera he took a picture the flash goes off and he's like whoa guys check this out so we look at it and sure enough you have like all this you know the foliage and you know trees here a bush there some flowers along here grass uh gravel so on and so forth but then there's this really bright i guess like floating mist probably about a foot off the ground And, you know, we tried to debunk it. This could have been fog. You know, maybe it is fog. We look. No, there's no fog there. Uh, Maybe it's just a light mist and we can't see it. Yeah, perhaps. We take a second picture. And guess what's not there? The mist. The green mist that was just there is now no longer there. And so it's very curious. You know, is it possible that he doctored it somehow? And, uh, you know, going through... Now that I'm majoring in film and doing all this film stuff, I'm pretty good at telling what's real and what's not in video and in pictures. And thinking back now to that picture, I can't think of a way that he would have been able to mess that with that thing, especially on a camera like that, just right in front camera. of us all. Yeah. Just a camera. Yeah, right in front of us. So that was the other, you know, interesting thing that happened on that particular investigation. We don't know what it was. We don't have any more evidence other than those three incidents. Uh, But it was interesting. It was intriguing. And actually, this isn't a rabbit trail, Justin. (laughs) But it does take me to another investigation real quick. That is kind of funny, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to laugh because it was actually our mistake until we took a closer look later on. We uh, went to this other place called Rockefeller. Yeah, I know exactly where this is going. So we went to Rockefeller Center here in Cleveland. Uh, it was uh, for a client. They had just bought, I don't think, they didn't buy the whole building. They bought some rooms down in the basement right. uh, for a gym and a uh, music studio, so music production studio and so on and so forth. They, they call us office, office type uh, yeah. rooms. Yeah. So we go in there, big group of people. Unfortunately, it was our mistake. I had some friends who wanted to tag along and I was like, Hey, all right, you can come check it out. We've been talking about getting them to go with us for a while, but I think there were a few more people than there should have been. Overall, the investigation went well. It was just the end. That was a little crazy trying to get people to be quiet while, uh, 
our client was conducting interviews for a little video he is making. And so we're in the gym area and in this gym area, there's a cellar and in the cellar is an office, but there used to be a chair in the center of this cellar that apparently had chains running from it. And these chains would bolt to either wall. And it's interesting because this area, this Rockefeller Center, was actually owned and used by the mob, by the mafia at one time. And so you've got to question what exactly happened in that chair with chains hanging from it. Now, Not only that, that particular office also had a huge freezer type door on it. It did. It had a huge freezer type door. And I do remember when we walked in there, it was a completely different atmosphere yeah. than what it was in the rest of the building. And so we never saw the chair or I correct that we did see the chair, but we never actually saw it like in that place. We never saw the chain, so on and so forth. But we saw the areas where the chains hooked up. It was now pretty much a completed office. So on and so forth. We're taking pictures all around the gym and we happen to take a picture over by this giant cellar that has this giant freezer door on it and it's cracked open a bit. We snap the picture, we come home, we're checking stuff out, and I think, was it you, Justin, that gave me the call, like, dude, you got to check this out? Yeah. And what do we see? A hooded figure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Kind of creepy. Like, what the heck? That's what There's we a, saw. <laughs> that's what we saw. It was a hooded figure. And so it's like, dude, I don't, I don't know, man. This is, this is insane. We gotta, we gotta tell this client right away. And we, we didn't tell him right away. We, we looked through the rest of this evidence, we took it to him, showed him everything, uh, had him take a look at the picture as well. And he's like, dad, dude, that, that's insane. I can't believe it. This is so cool. And it looked like there's a skull face. Yeah. You know, under this hood, you, you can see the hood, you can see like a skull face. And so we leave and, I'm here at home just kind of going through the pictures again, just for my own fun and reference. And I'm like, you know what? Let me take another look at this picture of this hooded figure. I blew it up, which is probably something we should have done beforehand because <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> and it turns out that this hooded figure was Justin. A tr- tree. A <laughs> tree. It was a tree. Yeah, it was a tree. Actually, a, plant. a fake tree at that. It was I a fake, think it was. Yeah, it was like a giant fern type tree thing. I don't know. Something that they had in the office that we should have seen beforehand. We didn't. We should have seen it in the picture before we presented it. We didn't. It wasn't until I blew it up and realized, crap, these are leaves. And this skull face is actually the gap between the leaves and the branches. And this hood is the leaf at the top of the tree. <laughs> So stupid is stupid does, and we were stupid in that particular <laughs> moment. <laughs> I'm but sure a hey. lot of ghost hunters have had those moments, but yeah. And now we know every ghost hunter out there right now is like, no, no, we haven't, guys. <laughs> no. You're stupid. <laughs> but you know, hey, you learned from your mistakes as many years ago, and we're still cool. Well, Talk Supernatural is having a a question Q and A episode this week. Oh, yeah. Actually just happened on Friday. If you guys missed it, go check it out. Uh, I am posing that question whether they've ever had mistakes or not. So check that out. Good question. Um, So people can say they don't make mistakes, but they do. They do, yeah. But uh, I think that's all we've got for you guys as far as the wraith. I mean, there's a little bit of myth, a legend, a couple personal experiences about what was called the wraith in in this area that we investigated and what looked like what we would think of as a wraith that that's that's about it i mean it is there's not a whole lot to the wraith legend but eric does have some scripture that applies a little bit to what we're talking about because wraith can also kind of tie in with the angel of death the angel of death Mm -hmm kind of has a scythe uh, most people depict him as a skeleton or ghoulish type creature uh, so why don't we do some scripture and see how that applies right okay so I'm going to read well I'm going to read one version and then give you an example uh, of similarities between other versions and kind of compare them 
But the one thing is people question, like, where did this angel of death come from? You know, where, where have we heard this before? Where has, where's its origin? You know, like, why this angel of death? Why the Grim Reaper? And some people believe in it. Some people don't, et cetera, et cetera. However, the angel of death is referred to in the Bible, believe it or not. And I'm going to take the first piece of scripture from the NIV, the New International Version. And I know there's a lot of people out there who question the NIV and don't like it and believe that it should be tossed away. I completely disagree. I've read through the entire thing, and it's actually very good. Just a lot of people are crazy. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and I know I'm going to get a bunch of crud for that if anyone who's against the NIV, here's a show. But regardless, it says, when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Exodus 12.23 Now the really big term here, the important term is the word destroyer because in other versions of the scripture which i know i would normally go to kjv for everybody but believe it or not for those of you who don't like the niv the niv and the kjv are pretty much the same so i'm going to skip over the kjv and go straight to the nlt because it uses a different term for destroyer in fact it says that god will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. And death angel is really the word we're looking for here because it's telling us about an angel who kills, an angel who's designed to destroy, who brings death. But there's a couple of interesting things here in in this passage. First and foremost, it's telling us that the Lord goes before this angel, which means that God is deciding who lives and who dies. God is the commander of this angel, the commander of armies. And so this angel cannot do anything without God's permission. And we actually see the same thing with demons in Job, the book of Job. Chapter one, we see it and we see it a couple of other times where even Lucifer can't touch Job because God has a hedge of protection around him. And Satan has to ask God's permission before he inflicts any pain or oppression on Job. So God, you know, he is the commander. He's the one who says, do this, who does that. God goes before everything. But what else is interesting here is that this passage, even though it's in the book of Exodus and it's telling us about the plagues uh, of Egypt or the plagues against Egypt, and this one being the death of the firstborn of every family, of every house, God tells them to take the blood of a lamb and smear it on the doorways, on the top doorway and the two sides. And this is a reference or fourth knowledge of what's going to happen so many thousands of years from then to when Jesus comes to earth, when he's born and dies on the cross for our sins. Why? Because as I just mentioned, God tells the people of Israel, the Jews, to take the blood of a lamb Jesus was known as the Lamb, the God of, or the Lamb of God, uh, the the Lamb without blemish, and they were told to take the blood and smear it on the doorways, on the on the uh, top doorway and the two were the left and the right, you know, top and sides of the door frame, not doorway. I'm sorry, the door frame, and that symbolizes the crucifix, the cross. The top and the two sides. Now, I know a lot of people are thinking like, okay, I see the top, it's thorns. I see the sides, it's the two nails in Jesus' hand, but where's the nail for Jesus' feet? Well, that's beyond the point here. You know, when it comes down to it, you have to see things the way that they are. And if you're going to go as far as saying, oh, well, hey, just because this is a lamb and the lamb's blood and it's on this doorway and kind of looks like a cross, but it doesn't have the feet, it can't possibly be the cross and it can't possibly be about Jesus. No, that's just baloney. This is very clearly, when you look into theology and you look into the Hebrew text, you learn that this is indeed a prophecy. 
a prophecy that God will send Jesus and that Jesus, the Lamb of God, will shed his blood, just like here, the blood of the Lamb, to protect and save his people. Here it says that the blood was smeared on the doorway and the the angel of death will pass by. Same thing in the New Testament. When Jesus' blood is shed on the cross for us and our sins, death no longer comes to us. We will never meet the second death. The body will die at some point, but we will never see hell. If, indeed, as I had said, we truly believe that Christ died and rose again for our sins, forgiving us completely. <clears throat> the other passage that I want to talk about just real quick is uh, Genesis 19. It's about Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed. I think there's a little bit of a misinterpretation here. Some people believe that the two angels, which were sent to uh, find a lot and bring him and his family out of this city because they were the only ones that were considered righteous in the entire city. These angels that brought them out, I think many people believe that they were the same beings, the angels, destroyed these two cities. But that's not true. All the angels did was go in, find Lot and the family, and then bring them out to safety. And then God, the Lord, was the one who sent basically just fire from the sky. It was most likely meteor <clears throat> that came down and destroyed both cities, killed everybody in them. What was interesting, though, about also about this particular uh, scripture is that they, Lot's family, was told not to look back at the cities. And this is something that kind of relates to how we should act today when we come to Christ through salvation, when we come to God. God wants us to focus on him, and he doesn't want us to look back at our past. What happened back in Genesis 19 was when they were taught to, or not taught, but when they were told to leave the city and never look back, Lot's wife decided, of course, to look back, and she suddenly became a pillar of salt. And she died. And that was it. And that was, I believe, a small reference to how we should, one, obey God's commands, and two, never look back. When you look back at your past, it brings destruction because it reminds you of what you think you may be missing or what uh, has hurt you in the past. And God wants us to have all of our attention, all of our focus on him when we become saved. And so, yeah, those are the two passages. I just thought the one really uh, helped, I guess, kind of push the idea of the angel of death and that he is a real being. Uh, he's an actual angel that, you know, has been made to destroy, to kill. And that was in Exodus 12, 23. And then Genesis 19. I think just a lot of people have that misinterpretation that angels were the ones that destroyed these two cities. But in reality, it was God. And beyond that, it kind of shows us how we should be living our lives once we're with Christ, and that we should always look to him and never look back. So, yeah. Well, and I hope she died when she turned to salt, because I don't want to know what living salt looks like or <laughs> tastes like. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> Can you imagine like pouring salt out onto like potatoes and all of a sudden they're like running everywhere and trying to get away? Or they're like dancing like, yeah, I'm salt. Like Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, and folks, really flat, <laughs> fast because we didn't <laughs> clarify what the wraith, why the wraith applies to, to uh, the uh, angel of death other than when we, when we first started the uh, the uh, scripture there uh, it, it is depicted as this grotesque like creature usually a skeleton with a, with a scythe so in a sense from all the lore that Eric came across the wraith has that same depiction uh, yeah and uh, maybe it was people just trying to describe the angel of death instead of a ghost or spirit, even though an angel is considered a spirit. Uh, right. it, so it could have been just a a 
man who didn't have the words to describe what he was seeing as he was dying. Some people believe the angel of death comes and whisks us away right away. We don't see him. Other people believe that when you are dying, you you see the angel of death or you see your family in a tunnel of light. Uh, so it could have been somebody just trying to describe something they saw either before they were dying or in a glimpse, as we said, with the doppelganger mm-hmm. of, of what was going to happen and that they were going to die. Right. And I think the, just the last thing I want to add to that is uh, I think they're, and don't quote me on this because obviously I don't, I'm not a spirit. I don't live in the spirit world. I don't know the true answer to this. Nobody does. If not, uh, then, I mean, if you were a, a spirit, you should be giving me these answers, man. I need to know these things. Yeah, I know. Gee, and, and that's that's the mistake. People go to mediums, and they talk to spirits that aren't real spirits. They, you know, they're, they're not good spirits. They're bad spirits. And then they get deceived. And so, really, if I was a spirit... I'd just be deceiving you because I wouldn't really be here in reality. But are um, you are you really not deceiving me right now? Well, right now I'm not deceiving you. Because, <laughs> because but other times you are. The other times, there's been times where I might have deceived you. But nothing about scripture and nothing about God. Well, but, no, I'm not saying that part. Yeah, just no, in no. general. <laughs> but in our personal everyday lives as family, yes. <laughs> No, not anyway, to say that I lie, but I do. Right. <laughs> exactly. And so real quick, I'm just going to say that there's nothing saying that uh, the angel of death goes and, you know, takes everybody's soul and brings them to God. That, that's not what we're saying. That's not what I'm saying. The scripture tells us that uh, when we die, we are tethered, in a sense, to God. And so when we die, our spirit bungees straight back to him. Because the scripture says to be out of the body is to be in the presence of God. And so basically, that's just telling us that once you die, your spirit goes straight to God, period. It goes back to its source, the one who created it. And then, of course, you have the judgment in heaven or hell. So, yeah, that's all I got on that. All right. <laughs> that's eric cleansing himself of, of that, was, that was yes topic. that was that was i'm done <laughs> get it out of here um <laughs> so uh as we said uh if you guys haven't listened to talk supernatural i do recommend you guys do that uh, they are good friends of the show there will be the question that i pose to them about if they've ever made mistakes when giving information to clients, uh, I I honestly don't know if they use <clears throat> all the the technology that that uh, most ghost hunters use because they do come from a Christian standpoint. So go check that out. Also, uh, if you heard last week's show, check out uh, Kay Carswell on the Deception Detection Show. Uh, she's usually an hour before us, so it's already passed. So go take a listen to that now that our show is mm-hmm. coming to an end. Actually, wait till our show's done, then go listen to her. Yes, yes, please, please. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have some real quick announcements for you guys before we uh, head out for the evening. Why don't you uh, start us off this week on our on our announcements? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, there, there's this thing. It's called the revealed. What's um, the revealed? What's the revealed, man? Oh, oh. Well, for those of you who don't know, it, it's this movie that I like. I like wrote, and uh, I'm directing and producing this fall, like late September, early October ish. It's about a girl. It's about, That's about a it. girl. It's about a girl. <laughs> no. Okay. It's about, that could be taken all the wrong ways. Let's I know. Keep on track. <laughs> no. It's about a young woman who encounters what she believes is alien life and uh, a friend that she meets up with who tells her he thinks it's something spiritual and of a much sinister, much more sinister nature. Um, of course, from another dimension of course of course because this is a sci-fi movie slash horror it's a fun movie it's gonna be fun anyway i uh yeah (laughs) (laughs) 
so as I had mentioned so many times over the past few months is that I would keep everyone up to date. And so last week I had mentioned about my sisters coming into town and everything for, for this film and helping me out with it as well. So I got them in as cast and crew. A new thing I had said last week, I was working on rewriting the script. Well, it's done. I finished it a couple of days ago. I shortened it like crazy. My original budget was $3,500. And because I shortened it, got rid of certain characters that I had in there, locations, um, a couple of, it just made it like from, it was 16 pages originally and I dropped it down to 11. So I'm pretty much dropping it from 3,500 bucks down to about mm, 1,500 to 2,000 for my budget for this film. And I know it sounds like still a lot of money for a short film, but to make a short film or any film, you need money. That's the business part of being creative in the film business. Uh, you have to have money in order to support the film itself. And of course, to support your cast, your crew and anything else. And so like, Could you imagine if you didn't need money for that, like how, oh, how much better? Well, I shouldn't say better because the movie's going to be awesome, but how much creative, uh, much more creative you could be <laughs> with yeah, no but I didn't budget. have to worry about the money. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah, I, I totally agree. And of course, you can always make movies uh, without a budget. You just got to be creative enough to create certain things. And I can't necessarily. Um, <laughs> no, some things I can. The, the big problem is this is the reason I really really need the money. One is to find my main actor in. I got a that's going to be like five hundred and thirty dollars for a round trip from L.A. to Virginia. And then back again. Well, it's not really, not really as round. It's kind of straight line from one place to the other and then back, especially since there's like several days between. But, um, I would hope she was going to stay there for a little while and choose yeah. to film. It would be a really, really short film if she's there for a day and has to leave. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, look, for example, if I, if I only raised $1,500, that's $530 already gone. Right. I'm below, you know, a thousand dollars now that I have left to spend and I need to buy, uh, props for the film for certain cast members. I need to buy food for the cast for 10 days. There needs to be breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, also snacks and beverages because it does get hot in Virginia. Uh, even in sept- uh, late September, early October, you're still looking at around 70 degrees at least. And when you're working hard, moving stuff and filming for anywhere from 8 to 16 hours on set, uh, you know, you get kind of thirsty. You get kind of hungry. Nah. <laughs> yeah, 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 we're, we're all capable. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, this money is important. It really is important to, uh, in regards to financing the film and of course, helping to support my cast and crew so that the film can get complete in the time that it's scheduled to be shot. So, yeah. So with that said, guys, I don't really have 1500 or $2,000 and I, I can't really make the money on my own. I'm a college student. It's my senior thesis project, which also happens to be a film festival piece that I plan on circulating to the festival. Um, a number hang of different on, festivals. Hang on, hang on. Cue sad music. And so it's just, it's really hard being a college student and just, you know, trying to make things fit and, and work out. And, you know, I could use the help, guys. I really can. <laughs> it's just $1,500. Five bucks would be enough from a, a lot of people, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, no, seriously, I think a helpful thought or prayer or sharing would be yeah, good. absolutely good. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's true. I am a college student. This is a thesis project. Uh, so it is for school. I do plan on putting it into the, uh, film festivals, the festival circuit, uh, next summer, 2016, maybe early fall. 
So it is a piece that will get out there. It is a piece that you, anyone who helps me, and even if you don't, you probably could see it. Uh, eventually, it will be up on our site for everyone to see, but it won't be for a while. Uh, but uh, I can use sponsors. I can. I really, it would be greatly appreciated if someone can help me, or several people can help me. Uh, you can help me at either <clears throat> GoFundMe.com. There is a link to it. If you go on to our uh Website. In fact, if you're already on our website listening to the show, just click on the Creative Works tab and you'll see the reveal. You'll see the full synopsis of the reveal. And then right at the bottom of the page, you'll see GoFundMe. You click on that, it'll take you straight to my uh, funding page and you can add any amount you want. It could be a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, there's no limit. There are perks for depending on the amount of money you give, and those range from a poster to T-shirts to uh, the DVD of the movie when it's complete. Uh, and of course, the more money you give, the you get that perk. For example, you'll get a, a DVD plus you'll get the T-shirt plus you'll get this plus you'll get that, so on and so forth. So the more you get give, the more you get in return. Uh, also, if you prefer to give money directly. You can, you know, hit us up at uh, paratruthradio at gmail.com. Let us know, you know, why you're getting in contact with us. Just say, you know, you'd like to support the film. Uh, if you just say the film, we'll know what you're talking about. And uh, I can get in contact with you and go from there. Also, if you can, please like and share my Facebook page for The Revealed. It is at facebook.com forward slash The Revealed. And uh, I believe it's the revealed, movie. the revealed movie. You're right. Yes, absolutely. It is facebook.com forward slash the revealed movie. So please like that page, share it with your friends. Uh, just let people know. And then please pray for me, please. This, uh, this is going to be a great piece. I think you guys will all love the movie when it comes out. And uh, I really, truly believe God is leading me on this. So yeah, that's the announcement today, guys. And I do encourage everybody to, to, either share and like the pages uh also whatever you can donate uh most people have a dollar to, to spare some don't but most do and uh i'm looking forward to this and would like to see it through to completion so uh all of you guys that uh listen come support eric in getting this film done um next on the agenda here really fast we are going to Scarefest. Paratruth Radio will be at Scarefest. Yeah! And uh, we will be doing a live show there. Uh, for those of you that uh, do attend it, uh, I know a lot of our listeners are both Christian and non-Christian. Uh, the Christian ones, I do warn you guys, it, can't, it is kind of dark, so I completely understand if you don't come to Scarefest, uh, but if you are there, uh, I do encourage you guys to to be listening in live on the Spreaker app or on the website, whichever, and uh, you can come find us wherever we're at. We'll be announcing where we're, we're uh, standing at the particular second that we're doing the broadcast, and you can track us down. Uh, we will be wearing our Paratruth Radio t-shirts with the new Paratruth logo on it, uh, so uh, definitely make sure you're checking that out if you will be at Scarefest. Absolutely. Bringing up the logo, it is within completion. We are pretty close to getting it done. We are going Mm -hmm. to be premiering it first week of August, as Mm -hmm. well as possibly a brand new intro for you guys. Yeah. As we said last episode, same pair of truth, just different logo, different intro. We're trying to to tune up the show a bit. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. And lastly... Lastly, drum roll, please. Oh, yeah. Starting in August, there is a new show coming to Paratruth. Doom, doom, doom. Uh, it will be called Paratruth The S Files. Uh, it's going to be s- sort of separate from the regular show. We still yeah. will have Paratruth Radio, uh, but we will also have Paratruth The S Files, which we will be going back. Uh, S standing for Night Stalkers. Even, yes, I know, guys. It starts with an N, but S, Stalker, Night Stalkers, get it? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> Trust me, the N files just doesn't sound right. Right. And it would take be taken wrong to, to some <laughs> people. So, Whoa. Um, <laughs> Whoa. Anyways, S files. Uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, 
you'll you'll see a splice of logos. You'll hear a splice of intros. Uh, we may even premiere the very very pathetic intro that we had towards the end <laughs> of Night Stalkers on Blog Talk Radio. Yeah, uh, and kind of pick that apart as well as. <laughs> Um, yeah. the, the S files is basically we're going to be listening to certain shows, uh, not the whole thing. Just we'll cut a piece of it, discuss what we believed back then, what we believe now, uh, compare and contrast, and leave it up to you guys to listen and uh, discern for yourselves what you think. Absolutely. So, folks, uh, please. Email us if you have any questions, any ideas, any thoughts about anything whatsoever at paratruthradio at gmail.com. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, so please talk to us. I also... We're <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but you know. uh, I do encourage you guys to always uh, j- jump into our chat as well. Uh, mm-hmm. We're there every week on show night, Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, we love to hear from you guys, whether it's through email, whether it's through chat. Uh, we do want to hear from you guys. Uh, any Facebook. type of... Yeah, Facebook, uh, Twitter. Uh, Twitter! So, uh, tweet, 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 Twitter! <laughs> and I do encourage you guys to uh, contact us about anything specific. If you have a question about a haunting, if you have personal beliefs that you want to share with us, uh, if there's something that you came across that we didn't and you think our information was wrong or needed to be added to. Yeah. If you guys need help, yeah, if you guys need help spiritually with anything, uh, like Justin said, if it's a haunting, some kind of a demonic oppression or affliction, you name it, contact us. We're, we're more than willing to help you. Uh, and I believe we have the knowledge, the strength, and the God to help with anything. So, All right, folks. That's all we have for you this week. Next week, we are going to have on Patrick Meekin. He is the author of two books about hauntings that he's had in two separate uh, houses. And week after that, we have a bloopers show for you guys Uh, if you guys want to hear cut out pieces that don't ever make it on air because it's rather embarrassing uh go ahead check that episode out as well i do encourage you guys to listen to every episode but i do understand if you guys cannot make it to every single one so were you gonna say something i was actually but now that you caught me i don't know if i should say it (laughs) go for it Folks, if in regards to the embarrassing, if you really want to see something embarrassing, check out our uh, website and look at Justin's picture. It's his face. It is very embarrassing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll just take it because, I don't know, hey, whatever. Whatever, man. Yeah, whatever. All I right. remember you doing that to me once on Night Stalkers. Did I really? Yes, you punk. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's about a, as... Uh, dirty as Eric's gonna get, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, right. Because uh, <laughs> yeah, most of the stuff will be cut out of Night Suckers, so don't don't judge those guys. If you ever go back and listen to Night Suckers, don't don't go back and listen to it. Don't, oh. Just don't. It was it was an awkward if, phase. If I could destroy them, I would, but I can't. It's on the internet now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, that's all we got for you guys. Have a good night. Uh, Again, next week, Patrick Meekin. Stay tuned for all the great stuff coming on up here on Paratruth Radio. I'm Justin. I'm Eric. Have a good night, guys. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode of Paratruth Radio and you would like to listen to it again or are interested in listening to any of our past episodes, then you can listen to them on HD at our website, paratruthradio.com. And you can also find us at Stitcher, Blueberry, TuneIn, iTunes, Spreaker, and YouTube. And of course, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for brand new updates of our show every day.